Schalten. Wenn ich Herr Schulze, die Kamera muss noch nicht laufen, aber Holger Lüre teilt mir gerade mit, dass gleich Borussia gegen Manchester spielt und das ist umso besser. Das ist das erste Champions-League-Spiel von Borussia in meiner Amtszeit, wo ich nicht mal daran denke, dass das heute stattfindet. Jetzt müssen wir den Kongress offenbar doch noch abbrechen. Ähm, sind die jetzt offen? Okay. Ich gehe noch ein bisschen nach oben.
weiß ich nicht. Sprechen Sie mal? Ja, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Die Welt ist alles, was der Fall ist. Na, ist doch ein bisschen. Good evening, everyone. Please let me remind you of the book exhibition in the main building, where a number of academic publishers uh, present their books. The response is not um, exactly overwhelming. So tomorrow morning is the last chance to leave through new publications to meet a number of philosophy editors and uh, senior managers of publishing houses in order to share experiences or discuss publication projects, to have a free coffee in the front of the Senatsaal, and to buy one of the few remaining tickets for the closing party, which are only available at the uh, info desk in the main building. Now for another highlight of this Congress, the Frege Award. Every three years, the GAP honors a German-speaking senior philosopher for outstanding achievements in analytic philosophy. The previous awardees were Wolfgang Kühne, Rüdiger Bittner, Wolfgang Spohn, and Dieter Birnbacher. This year, Martine Niederrümelin was selected by the Frege Award Jury for her outstanding work in the philosophy of mind and consciousness. Almost 30 years ago, Martine, you received the Wolfgang Stegmüller Prize for your PhD thesis on colors and phenomenal knowledge. It was the first Stegmüller Prize that the GAP awarded. Today, a circle closes in the nicest way. The Frege Prize is the highest honor that the GAP has to award. And Whatever academic successes you will achieve in the future, they won't consist in another GAP award. The laudation will be held by Terence Horgan from the University of Arizona. After the laudation <coughs> and the award ceremony, <coughs> there will be a panel discussion on Martine Niederrümelin's recent and even forthcoming work. Terry, the floor is yours. Well, I'm really honored and delighted to be able to do this laudation for my friend and very respected colleague, Martina Niederrumelin. She's had an extremely significant role in challenging many aspects of philosophical orthodoxy and the philosophy of mind, but it should be said that at the same time, her work in philosophy of mind has been very richly constructive. Uh, this constructive aspect has really been there all along in the 30 years that she's been doing this, but it will be especially prominent in her forthcoming and now partially completed new book, Conscious Individuals, Sketch of a Theory. In this book, she develops a unified theoretical account of conscious subjects, of what they are metaphysically. And one thing that is very characteristic of her approach is that she puts the experiencing subject at the center, theoretically, the one who experiences and thinks and acts, rather than focusing primarily on mental experiences or mental properties. She suggests a conceptual framework that she calls the subject property framework, which she contends is quite radically different from the familiar one that she calls the experience property framework. And within this subject property framework, she sets forth an account of the nature of the conscious subject that integrates into one big philosophical picture, her ideas about experience, about self-awareness, about personal identity and individuality, about agency and being active. This is a big picture in which all of these ideas hang together and mutually support one another. It's a bold and provocative philosophical big picture, one that not only challenges much or orthodoxy in recent and current philosophy of mind, but also as a richly constructive alternative to this 
orthodoxy. Now, one form of orthodoxy, especially in the period commencing from around 1960, is functionalism about human mentality, probably most famously associated with Hillary Putnam, but also advocated in effect by David Armstrong and David Lewis. They were pushing a psychophysical identity theory, but they were functionalists nonetheless because they had a functionalist construal of mental concepts, and on their construal, mental concepts functionally characterizable or functionally analyzable, non-rigidly non designate first order of physical properties, hence the identity theory. A second form of orthodoxy commencing in 1963 with Donald Davidson's very influential paper, Actions, Reasons, and Causes, was a conception of human agency as involving behavioral events that are causally generated by mental events or maybe mental, combina mental event combinations, like a combination of an occurrent belief and an occurrent desire. A third form of orthodoxy, commencing around 1972 with Frank, Jox Frank Jackson's well-known paper, Epiphenomenal Qualia, was a position that acknowledges that some mental states, which then were often called qualia, have intrinsic phenomenal character. Intrinsic, what it's likeness. Like pains, itches, smells, color experiences. And on this conception, at least back then, qualia states were conceived as being non-intentional. They don't have representational content. And so there was an accompanying sharp distinction within the orthodoxy between qualia conceived this way and intentional mental states like occurrent beliefs and occurrent desires. Uh, this is what collaborators and myself have, have labeled separatism, two rather distinct kinds of mental states. And that picture tended to embrace functionalist thinking about intentional mental states, even though it repudiated functionalism about qualia because of the intrinsicness of qualia. Functional properties are not mentally intrinsic. They, their, their essence is causal dispositional. And in this, in this orthodoxy, there were persistent attempts to give a materialism-friendly account of qualia in some non-functionalist way. For example, by arguing that although phenomenal concepts are distinct from concepts deployed in physics or in neuroscience, nevertheless, phenomenal properties are identical to physical or neurophysical properties. Now, lying behind all three of these forms of orthodoxy was an overarching and I think more fundamental orthodoxy, a commitment to a broadly materialist metaphysics, and in particular to a broadly materialistic conception of human agents and human mentality. So that would include claims like these. First, every physical chemical event, including in the human brain and central nervous system, is fully causally determined to the extent that it's determined at all by prior physical chemical events. Second, all phenomena in the world, including all human mental and actional phenomena, are supervenient on physical chemical phenomena. And so third, all phenomena in the world are fully determined to the extent that they're determined at all by prior physical chemical phenomena. And in particular, all human mental and actional phenomena are fully determined to the extent that they're determined at all by prior physical chemical phenomena within either the human brain itself, the brain and the central nervous system, or by physical chemical impingements on the human central nervous system from the external environment. Now, as I said, Martina has been a major and influential figure in philosophy of mind in a way that involves bold and vigorous challenges to all of these orthodoxies. She maintains, and I agree, that functionalism and philosophy of mind cannot accommodate the phenomenal aspects of human mentality, the mental aspects such that there's something that it's like for the conscious agent to instantiate them. What it's likeness is an intrinsic mental feature, whereas functional role is entirely a causal dispositional feature. She's had a lot to say about attempts in philosophy of mind to acknowledge this fact about the intrinsicness of qualia, the inadequacy of functionalism about qualia, 
but, uh, but nonetheless try, trying to reconcile the position, re reconcile the non-functional nature of qualia with met metaphysical materialism. She's been one of the most influential voices in the ongoing discussion about phenomenal properties and phenomenal concepts that arose in the wake of Frank Jackson's famous thought experiment about Mary the colorblind neuroscientist. And she's been a sharp and persistent critic of attempts to accommodate phenomenal mental properties within materialistic metaphysics, attempts that often deploy one or another version of what has come to be called the phenomenal concept strategy. Now, according to her own positive account of phenomenal mental properties and phenomenal and corresponding concepts, phenomenal concepts, a phenomenal concept arises from actually instantiating the pertinent phenomenal property. And it arises in such a way that possession of the concept requires having experienced the phenomenal properties instantiation by oneself. And the phenomenal concept fully reveals the essential nature of the phenomenal property. And phenomenal concepts are independent of physical scientific concepts and of functional concepts as well. And so she contends on the basis of these claims that phenomenal properties are not identical to or reducible to physical or functional properties. She's a property dualist about phenomenal properties. This is a theme that Par Sundstrom will address in our upcoming symposium on Martina's work. She also maintains that the phenomenal aspects of human mentality are vastly wider in scope than is often acknowledged in philosophy of mind and are richly intentional in the sense of having representational content. Sensory phenomenal features, for example, normally are intentional. Color properties, color experiences, for example, represent external objects as instantiating color properties on their surfaces. Pain experiences and itch experiences represent parts of one's own body as being painful or being itchy. Occurrent beliefs and occurrent desires, for example, normally have distinctive, albeit non-sensory, phenomenal character. There's something that it's like to occurrently desire another beer or to occurrently believe that there's more beer in the refrigerator. And one's own actions for example, have a distinctive, vivid, and richly intentional phenomenal character. One experiences one's own behaviors as generated purposively by oneself as their originating source. And one does not experience one's behaviors as causally generated by certain states of oneself, such as the current beliefs or a current desires or combinations of such states. Now in much of this, she and I are in agreement. To this extent, we've been fellow travelers in challenging various kinds of orthodoxy and philosophy of mind. But whereas I still want to embrace some form of materialism about mentality and human agency, although I'm unhappy with orthodox versions of materialism, she takes the approach of repudiating materialism. So that's a significant difference between us and a significant boldness in her own view. We also agree that the phenomenology of agency poses at least a prima facie challenge to the widely influential Davidsonian conception of human agency, and also poses at least a prima facie challenge to a broadly materialist conception of human agents and human mentality. When one attends to one's own agentive experiences, one's experiences of oneself as the source of one's purposes, behaviors, it can easily seem that these experiences represent oneself as being thoroughly outside of the state causal nexus. Um, outside of the physical chemical state causal nexus and outside of any wider state causal nexus that's supervenient on the physical, of the physical chemical state causal nexus. So accordingly, it can easily seem that a Davidsonian materialism-friendly conception of human agency is profoundly incompatible with the actual content of human agentive experience. It can easily seem that such experience represents our actions not as caused by mental states of ourselves, such as the current belief-desire combinations, but rather as originating from ourselves as rational agents outside the state causal nexus. To adapt Wilfred Sellers' famous phrases, 
it can easily seem that we experience ourselves as residing qua rational agents within the space of reasons and outside of the space of causes. Now, once one acknowledges all of this, one faces three generic philosophical options. First, claim that a broadly materialist conception of human agents and human mentality is incompatible with the intentional content of human agentive experience. Affirm a broadly materialist conception of human agency and embrace an error theory about this intentional content. In other words, hold that humans are not really agents of the kind we experience ourselves to be. Second option, claim that a broadly materialist conception of human agents and human mentality is incompatible with the intentional content of human agentive experience. Affirm that human agents, humans really are agents of the kind we experience ourselves to be and repudiate a broadly materialist conception of human agents and human mentality. In other words, reject materialism in the philosophy of mind. Third option, claim that a broadly materialist conception of human agents and human mentality is really compatible with the intentional content of human agentive experience, despite seeming incompatible prima facie. Affirm a broadly materialist conception of human agency and affirm that humans really are agents of the kind we experience ourselves to be. In other words, embrace materialist compatibilism about the phenomenology of agency. Now, I don't know of anyone in philosophy who clearly advocates the first option, although some philosophers who espouse hard incompatibilism about the free will problem, for example, Dirk Parabum or Galen Strawson, might be willing to extend that position into a full-blown materialist incompatibilism about human agency. Martina herself is a powerful and vigorous advocate of the second position in a number of her prior papers and in the book she's now writing. And, there's a, and there are clear affinities, I think, between her position and metaphysical libertarianism about the free will issue. And this is another place where I part company with Martina because I myself espouse the third position. I also advocate compatibilism about the free will issue, and I hold that the phenomenology of agency should be an integral part of the free will debate. In recent years, Martina and I have engaged in active dispute with one another about this topic including in a co-authored dialogue on the satisfaction conditions of agentive phenomenology that recently appeared in the Routledge Handbook on the Phenomenology of Agency. And I have to say that I've found her sharp and incisive criticisms of my own position very challenging and very helpful. Indeed, her objections have caused me to refine and alter and elaborate my position quite significantly in ways that I think improve and strengthen it considerably. But as I'm, well, I'm very well aware, she remains quite unpersuaded. This philosophical dispute between us will be the topic of my own presentation in the upcoming symposium on her work. Now, for many years, Martin Nina Rubin has been a major force in philosophy of mind. She's incisively challenged various forms of orthodoxy. She's powerfully urged the extensiveness and the intentional richness of phenomenal consciousness. She has boldly defended a philosophical conception of human agency and human mentality that's sharply at odds with the broadly materialist metaphysics that remains prevalent in philosophy of mind and that I myself continue to espouse. She's a fine philosopher. She's my friend and valued colleague. She's eminently deserving of the Frege Prize, and I'm honored to introduce her for the prize. It's my great pleasure to invite Martina to enter the stage.
Let me read out the certificate of the Frege Award. It's in German. Fregepreis der Gesellschaft für analytische Philosophie. Mit ihrem philosophischen Werk hat sich Professor Dr. Martine Niederrümelin um die analytische Philosophie verdient gemacht. Berlin, den 14. September 2022. Applaus So I asked if I have the right to say one or two sentences. <laughs> I just wanted to say I'm very pleased, very happy and glad about this, that my work has been chosen and thank you very much to the committee for this choice. And I have a particular reason for being so happy about this because there is an almost coincidence between this event and my finally getting to an end with a book that I have been writing of. <laughs> I did for many years. It should be in the exhibition, but it's not. It's not ready, it should have been, but it's very close to it. And so now I have the hope that perhaps more people will look into it. And I also have the very not modest impression that there are insights in that book, and I want to share these insights. So I'm happy if it gets more visibility via this award. Thank you very much. Well, Terry, Christina, Per, Martine, would you please join me? In the past few days, I've seen a lot of uh, email traffic between the panelists, so I'm pretty confident that we will have a lively, yeah, come off, yeah, bitte, that we will have a lively discussion. Let me now uh, turn over the floor to Christina Musholt, who will chair the colloquium of, uh, who will chair the colloquium in honor of um, Martina's work. Christina is. Professor of Cognitive Anthropology at the University of Leipzig. Her research focuses on the philosophy of mind and of cognitive science. Thank you very much. And yeah, let me welcome uh, you all to our colloquium on Martina's forthcoming book, Conscious Individuals. Um, as was already mentioned, the title uh, refers to a work where she really tries to bring together into one big picture her view on the main themes that she's been working on over the decades, over the years, and that have been so beautifully outlined in uh, Terry's Laudatium just, just now. So among them, experience, consciousness, but also self-awareness, identity across time and possible worlds, and agency and freedom, and these are all themes that are explored in detail in the book. Um, given that Terry just uh, already described the key points of the book, there's not much for me to add at this point. Um, I just wanted to emphasize one central assumption that underlies Martina's approach and that strikes me as uh, quite significant. Namely, the thought that based on being experiencing subjects, we all already have an implicit knowledge of what it is to be an experiencing subject. And what's more, we have access to our own nature as experiencing subjects due to the fact that we are experiencing subjects. Um, so that strikes me as a very significant 
thought that underlies much of um, what Martina is trying to do in her work and in particular in this book. Um, so what she's trying to do is basically make explicit this understanding that we, according to her, already possess on an implicit level. So let's use this opportunity, this colloquium, um, to bring her and our thinking about conscious subjects to the surface in order to examine and discuss them together. And as you can see on the schedule, we'll begin with the commentary by Per Sundström. He's professor of philosophy at the Omeo University in Sweden, and his research focuses on consciousness, perception, colors, concepts, and their acquisition, and cognitive development more generally. And he will comment on Martina's thoughts on phenomenal concepts. Um, she will then give a brief response to his comments. After that, uh, Terry Hogan, whom we've already met, who is um, from the University of Arizona and who has, over the years, worked on many of the same topics and themes as Martina and has been in constant exchange with her as well, will comment on her uh, thoughts on phenomenal concepts. Again, she will give a brief reply. And then we will have a general discussion to which all of you, of course, um, are invited to contribute. So I'll hand over to Pear. Uh, yeah, uh, much as I'm tempted, I'm not going to repeat the laudations. Uh, I'm just going to say that for all the reasons that have been given, I'm also very honored uh, to participate in this symposium and uh, glad to be able to uh, think about some things jointly that Martina and I have been both thinking about uh, for a long time. So here's my plan. I'm going to first make some initial remarks about phenomenal concepts. Then I'm going to introduce and discuss Martina's claim, a claim that she makes that she calls phenomenal essentialism. And then I'm going to introduce and discuss an argument uh, that she gives the argument from understanding against physicalism. And perhaps aptly, given the, uh, the award ceremony, uh, Frege is going to look down at us every now and then from the third realm here. OK, so uh, he's with us from the very start. Uh, the familiar idea is that we can have one and the same thing and two different thoughts about it. So some ancient astronomers thought about the morning star, and they thought about the evening star, and though they didn't realize it, they were thinking about the same thing. So they had two different cognitive routes that took them to the same thing. Uh, phenomenal concepts, as usually understood as a certain way of thinking about conscious states, a, a certain route that we have to conscious states. So to illustrate, suppose I uh, have had, have or have had a pain in my back, then uh, on the strength of my familiarity with that sensation, I may think the sensation, the type of sensation that feels like so. And then I or someone else can also think uh, the most salient aspect of John Searle's current conscious state not knowing what that is, but it might turn out to be that that's the same type of sensation. If so, that's uh, another thought about the same thing. But the latter thought would be a non-phenomenal thought, and the first thought would be a phenomenal thought. I happen to know that John Searle complained about back pains a lot, so it's not completely unlikely that it's about the same thing. Then there's a lot of discussion uh, in the literature about how exactly to understand phenomenal concepts. I think Martina has a ton of good and interesting things to say about that, but time is short, and I'm a philosopher, so I'm gonna skip all the things that I am really in agreement with and focus on some things that I <laughs> have more questions about. Uh, so let's start with a claim that uh, Martina calls phenomenal essentialism. That's a claim about a subclass of phenomenal concepts that she calls uh, maximally specific pure phenomenal concepts of pure experien experiential uh, properties. I'm not going to go through all that mouthful. Um, what's important for us is that there are two parts to this claim, an ontological part and an epistemic part. 
The ontological part says that pure experiential properties are exhausted by the way it is like to have them. And the epistemic part says that maximally specific pure phenomenal concepts provide full access to the natures of these properties. These concepts are nature revealing. We're going to be mostly occupied with the epistemic claim here. I next want to highlight two distinctions uh, and then say a little bit about how I think uh, this claim should be understood. Uh, the first distinction concerns this full access that uh, appears in this claim. Uh, so we can distinguish access that is complete and access that is correct or error-free. Uh, access can be complete in that it doesn't leave anything out, and it can be error-free in that it contains no error. So to illustrate, suppose someone of you asks me to list as many Swedish kings as I can. Then my, my answer might be complete in that it contains all the Swedish kings, but I might also add a few people who have not been Swedish kings. Then my answer is complete, but it includes error. Or, uh, maybe more likely, uh, I say a few kings. Uh, they have all been kings of Sweden. Then my list includes no error, but it's incomplete because there are kings that it doesn't include. If I'm very knowledgeable, uh, my list and reality might line up perfectly. So I have both complete and error-free uh, answer. But there's also a chance that it's neither complete or fully correct. I, fail to list all the kings, and in addition, I include some who have not been. So there's full independence between these. And I think uh, that Martinez' full access here is meant to be the case where it's perfect alignment between uh, reality and conception. Uh, uh, the access is complete and error-free. So it's quite something. The next distinction I want to highlight is between an impersonal and what I call a we now reading of this phenomenal essentialism. <clears throat> the impersonal reading uh, says that there are phenomenal concepts of this kind that provide complete and error-free access to the natures of these experiential properties. And the we now reading says that we now have such concepts. So now Frege is going to look down at us again uh, because I propose to explain this impersonal reading with Frege's help. So Frege compared Zinne to uh, lenses in telescopes or images that are projected uh, on lenses on telescopes. These are things that are there whether or not anybody accesses them, and they are there for many different people to access. Similarly, we can think about phenomenal concepts, uh, and if we think about phenomenal concepts in those ways, they are perspectives that are, as it were, there to be had, and that provide full and complete access to the natures of these experiential properties. There are perspectives that are there to be had, whether or not anyone currently has them or has ever had them. They provide full and complete access to these things. That's all that the impersonal claim says. The we now claim says that we now occupy such perspectives. Uh, they are not just there to be had, we actually have them in our mental repertoire. Here, uh, I, I say that I'm a little less sure which reading Martina has in mind. Now I'm, uh, I am sure, because she told me an hour ago, uh, so she will clarify this. But I find it useful anyway to go through, to keep both these readings in mind uh, uh, when I now turn to discuss um, Martina's argument from understanding, which is an argument that aims towards uh, the conclusion that physicalism is false. Uh, this is a bit uh, um, uh, subtle, um, as Martinez' writings tend to be. Therefore, I gave you a handout so you can follow it. Um, 
I, I opted for a somewhat semi-formal uh, uh, thing uh, just because I needed to check that it was valid, uh, which it is, I think. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it a little less <laughs> formally. Uh, so the first premise is that phenomenal concepts and physical concepts are generally conceptually independent. And that means, roughly speaking, that they are not derivable from one another which in turn, roughly speaking, means that even a rational subject uh, couldn't infer that one applies, given the information that the other applies, and vice versa. So at least one of the paths from one to the other or from the other to the one is blocked, even for a rational subject. Um, that's the first premise. Um, yeah, oh yeah, I was going to illustrate it. So uh, here is the idea. Suppose I find out that an octopus in a, is in a specific neural state. Then, and suppose that even given that information and given that I'm fully rational, I can't, as it were, reason my way into uh, the conclusion that it feels like so to be the octopus. If that's the case, then these concepts are uh, uh, independent. They are not derivable from one another. And the contrast here, I take it, is supposed to be something like the case of bachelor and unmarried male. If someone has both of these concepts, then you can derive each from the other. Uh, if you know that someone is a bachelor, you can figure out that they are an unmarried male and vice versa. That's, uh, suppose that's not the case even for someone who is rational and has both the concepts of the neural state N and the concept of feeling like so. If that's the case, then these two concepts are uh, uh, not interderivable. Uh, and the first premise says that that's so for all phenomenal and physical concepts. The second premise uh, says that for all, I'm, I'm going to skip the pure and maximum the specific from now on. Uh, and I'm also going to skip uh, the natures of things. Um, uh, uh, so, for all experiential properties, there is a phenomenal concept that uh, gives complete and correct access to its nature. That might sound uh, a bit strong, uh, but at least if we keep the impersonal reading in mind, uh, it sounds more reasonable, I think. Then it just says that for every property, there is a perspective on it there to be had that reveals its nature. There might be more complications on the, on the we now reading uh, of that. Uh, I'll return to that later. Um, the third premise says that if you have a concept X and a concept Y, and both of these concepts are fully nature revealing, uh, and they are of the same thing, uh, then they are not conceptually independent. Then the rational speaker can derive one from the other. So they are derivable. That's to say, if you have a concept X and a concept Y that give uh, full access to the nature of a thing, and the thing is one, then this identity is transparent. You can just see that they are concepts of one thing. That's the idea of the third premise. Um, from these premises, we can infer that uh, no physical concept provides full access to an experiential property. Um, unless that's obvious, I added a little proof of it. Suppose there is some physical concept uh, uh, that, uh, that provides full access. Then by the second premise there, uh, there is also a phenomenal concept that provides full access to the property. Then by the third premise, these two concepts, the physical and the phenomenal one, must be derivable from one another. But by the first premise, no such two concepts are derivable from one another. Uh, then we have a contradiction, so uh, the conclusion one must be right. Now, um, so it, now it might seem, so now we have conclusion one. Uh, and that 
you might, as it were, smell that we're getting close to anti-physicalism here. Uh, uh, Martina then adds a premise that is in some ways a bit cautious. Uh, 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 she says that uh, if you take a given experiential property uh, and uh, there is, uh, if we're in a given uh, uh, experiential property, there is a phenomenal concept that provides full access to it, and there is no physical concept that does so, then uh, that property is partly non-physical. Um, maybe the most crucial bit there is this, the last bit of the antecedent, that if, if no physical concept provides full, full access to the property, then the property must be non-physical. Um, and from that all, we can infer that uh, these experiential properties are non-physical. I added a little proof of that too, uh, but I'll skip that for now. Okay, so, so we got to conclusion two. In order to get from conclusion two to physicalism, we need to add a little bit, maybe that uh, experiential proper uh, properties exist and maybe even are instantiated. I think we can take that to be background assumptions here. That's at any, in any case something that Martina argues for a lot uh, in other places. Uh, okay, so let me now um, uh, look at this argument a bit and discuss it. Um, and I'm going to go back now to this impersonal and we now readings. So the formulations here are relatively impersonal, but I'm going to start to look at the we now reading of the argument. So then I tweak it a little bit. Um, I'm going to leave premise three as it stands. I'm going to tweak so three of the other premises and we're going to get uh, a different intermediary conclusion. So the first premise now says, says that all phenomenal and physical concepts that we have are conceptually independent, uh, not derivable from one another. And the second premise now says that for every experiential property, we now have uh, a, a, a nature revealing uh, a concept of it. The third premise is still that if a concept X and Y both provide full access to one and the same thing, and that identity is transparent. Um, from that, we now get a, a we now first conclusion, which is that we don't now have a physical concept that reveals uh, the nature of any experiential property. And now the extra premise says that if, if a given experiential property is such that we now have a phenomenal concept that provides full access to it, but we don't now have a physical concept that provides full access to it, uh, then that experiential property is partly non-physical. And from that, we can derive that experiential properties are partly non-physical. Um, so this, I think, is a fairly problematic argument. Um, I already flagged uh, a, a little bit of flag for premise two. I think that's actually not a crucial problem there, even though it must, might sound strong um, that we now, because I think there are ways of weakening this, just because I think we don't need, we, are, we just in the end, we need only one experiential property that satisfies this argument. So therefore I think there are ways of dealing with this, uh, maybe implausible, the premise two that sounds implausible as it stands. So, so the premise two as it stands says that for every uh, experiential property we have, we now have a nature revealing concept or that would apply to octopuses and stuff like that. But I think there are ways of, of, of fixing that. Uh, the more uh, uh, crucially problematic uh, premise here is I think the fourth one. So let's just take what I think is, we can take as, as innocent here. Suppose we do have, for every experiential property, a phenomenal concept that provides full access to it. Then in effect, premise four says that uh, uh, if, uh, if 
our current physical concepts don't reveal things to be a certain way, then things are not that way. But that's uh, an inference that we should be very cautious uh, to make generally. If our current ways of thinking don't reveal things to be that way, they are not that way. Because our current ways of thinking are probably not perfect as they are. And they probably don't, don't mirror and capture all of reality as it is. So reality may be in ways other than we currently think and understand. Yes, good, I think I'll manage that actually. Um, I think uh, the, the history of science uh, uh, gives us many examples uh, where uh, uh, that should uh, make us cautious about this kind of inference. So I think the argument is better on an impersonal reading, uh, which uh, Martina will soon reveal is the one she had in mind. Uh, <laughs> or I re just revealed it. Um, um, so here, uh, uh, so it already had an impersonal sort of flavor, I just emphasized it here. So here we are talking about perspectives that are there to be had. So when we say, for example, in premise one, uh, that uh, all phenomenal and physical concepts are independent of one another, then we're talking about perspectives that are there to be had whether or not anyone currently or ever uh, currently has them or will ever have them. Uh, uh, premise two says that uh, for every experiential property, there is such a perspective that captures the nature of the thing. Uh, premise three says as before, uh, premise four says that if there is uh, 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 sorry, the intermediary conclusion importantly says that there is no physical concept, as it were, and no, there is no obtaining, objectively obtaining lens such that the lens is physical, whatever that exactly means, and that captures the full nature of any experiential property. Um, and from there we get to non-physicalism. Now on this reading, I think the, uh, I already mentioned this, the second premise is probably not so problematic. It just says that for every experiential property, there is a phenomenal way of, of, of uh, uh, that provides full access to it. Well, I think it's much more plausible on this reading in, in any case. Um, the fourth premise uh, uh, looks fine. The important part of this is that if there is no physical lens that fully reveals the nature of an experiential property, then that property is not fully physical. That seems plausible, at least much more plausible than on the earlier version. Premise three, I never had any quarrel with in, in any case. I think that's plausible. But on this reading, I think premise one uh, raises a serious question. Uh, so it's kind of a similar point that I made about the first argument. Presumably, we don't now have the best perspectives on things. But premise one makes a claim about how things come across from the best perspectives on things. So we're making a claim about how things seem from perspectives that we probably don't have at the moment. And I think the history of science again teaches us that we're gonna, there are gonna be better perspectives than the ones we have. Uh, and we can't really imagine or conceive of what things are like from these perspectives. So given that, uh, my question about this argument is how we can be so assured that premise uh, one is right, that the best phenomenal ways of thinking about things and the best physical ways of thinking about things will still be cognitively, will still be independent of one another. So I'm thinking that, I mean, future introspection, future phenomenology, 
might give us better phenomenal ways of thinking about consciousness. Other parts of philosophy of mind, other parts of cognitive science might contribute. I'm thinking definitely biology, neuroscience, uh, uh, and other sciences will give us uh, better ways of understanding the brain. In addition, there will be disciplines that we don't even know about today that will also contribute to this. Uh, and, and given that, uh, one wonders if we can be very confident about the premise like one. If I may round up very ever so briefly, um, I should say, just to locate this in the literature, that I have, in effect, just been advertising a response to uh, anti-physicalist arguments that is fairly familiar. It goes back uh, at least to Nagel's paper in uh, 1974, where Nagel spends, I don't know, half or two thirds of the paper arguing that the problem of consciousness is so intractable, so incredibly intractable, incre intractable, intractable, intractable. And then uh, he says, what morale should we draw from that? Well, maybe it's just that we don't understand things well enough. Uh, that's, in effect, the kind of line I've been pulling. Then later on, McGinn and Stolger have said these things. I think it's often dismissed in the literature, not given the kind of attention it deserves. And I speculate that it's because uh, it's been associated with some radical things that have been added to this, especially by McGinn, who's kind of given this view maybe <laughs> a, a, a bad reputation. But I think we can distinguish a generic claim, which is the one I've been promoting here, that we probably don't now uh, occupy the best perspectives on things, and who knows what things are like from those best perspectives from the kind of radical claim that McGinn makes, for example, and sometimes Nagel too, that uh, uh, we're cognitively close to these, or there is a scientific revolution away, we can, know, we can do no better than wait and see. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the generic claim that I've been promoting, uh, there's nothing particularly mysterious about it. It's something we can uh, almost derive from the history of science. And it doesn't, uh, sort of invites any passive wait and see attitude. It's very compatible with rolling up our sleeves and trying to improve our current ways of thinking about things. Anyway, uh, uh, with that, uh, again, um, thanks to Martina for providing uh, thought, this food for thought. So thank you very much for this very interesting and challenging comment. Um, I want to be very brief because I want us to have a lot of time for the audience afterwards, for the reaction from the audience, and I will focus on one particular point. But I should say in advance, I had time only this afternoon to think about your two comments. So what I'm saying, what I will be saying might not might be my final reply. <laughs> um, could be preliminary. So I would like to focus on the following. Um, let me see if I... Yeah, so you asked whether it's the impersonal or the we now reading of the argument, and as you said, it's the impersonal reading, so that in principle there are concepts that provide full access to the nature of experiential properties. I'm sorry? I, oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, and now your your objection is that on that reading, premise one is not motivated, or is not motivated well enough, right? And uh, you say the following, or in the original version, you said the following. However, here I think there's room for reasonable doubt about premise one, so if we choose this um, impersonal interpretation, here that premise concerns impersonal lenses on things, presumably we do not have I do not now have access to all such lenses. And again, I take the history of science to teach us that there may in the future be perspectives available to us that are not in our current cognitive repertoire. Given that, what grounds do we have to be so assured that the impersonal premise one is correct? So the question I put into bold, and this is what I will try to respond to, what are the reasons that one can give for accepting premise one on that reading? Now, um, in order to 
formulate my reply, I need to introduce some terminology, um, namely what it is for a concept to be subject presupposing. So intuitively, what do I mean? Um, let me take an example. If you say of an elephant that it's sad, perhaps because it has lost its child, then you presuppose that the elephant is an experiencing subject. You presuppose that the elephant belongs to a particular category of entities, namely to those entities that are capable of having properties such that it's like something for, the, for that individual to have them. So you presuppose that you are dealing with a subject when you attribute sadness or when you attribute pain or when you attribute a genuine conscious thought and so on and so forth. Now my definition of what it is for a concept of a property to be subject presupposing is this. The concept C of the property P is subject presupposing if and only if in attributing that property using that particular concept to a specific individual A, one either assumes that A itself is an experiencing subject or one assumes that A is in a specific, specific way related to an experiencing subject. And they call subject neutral concepts those that are not subject presupposing. And now I have two claims, and I won't have much time. No. What? I'm sorry. Perhaps I don't see what's going on here. I see another slide than the one you see, perhaps. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that? Now I'm on the right, right one. That's the one I wanted. Sorry. So you can read the definition. I won't read it out again. <laughs> um, so I have two claims, and they help me to respond to Pear's objection. The first claim, and that's the claim that does the work, physical concepts are not subject presupposing. And the second, I think it's quite obvious, is that subject presupposing concepts and subject neutral concepts are conceptually independent. So I say something about the second. Uh, first, um, if you attribute to an object only properties that leave it open, whether you are dealing with the subject or you're not dealing with the subject, then it cannot be that it conceptually follows from what you are assuming that you have to do with an experiencing subject. So that's something that I, um, I justify in detail in chapter two of my book about the explanatory gap, where I say that the specific explanatory gap, the so-called explanatory gap, cannot be closed for that reason. Right. Now, perhaps the first claim is the one that um, Pear will have doubts about. So what I'm saying here is that concepts do not deserve to be called physical if they are subject presupposing. I'm not saying that physics couldn't develop in the future into a science that explicitly introduces experiencing subjects, perhaps among their fundamental entities. Wonderful, I would be very pleased to see this. And I, I think it's absolutely possible that for explanatory purposes, science will develop in a manner where subjects will be introduced, and then we will have subject presupposing concepts of properties as well. However, I would say, in that case, we would have completely changed um, our view of reality. And it would be very strange to say that we are still only talking of physical properties. So if you take an example, if physics one day will attribute properties to electrons that presuppose that the electron must be a subject for having that property, well, is materialism then still right? <laughs> and is this still <laughs> a physicalist view of the world, um, I would say that at that point, dualism would have won, right? Um, so if that's the kind of physicalism that we are looking at, then it's perhaps only a struggle with terminology, whether we still wanted to call it physicalism or not. So that's, that's very roughly uh, my motivation for claim one. 
So the physical concepts that we should be interested in here in our subject presupposing, and if they are conceptually independent from every subject, uh, not pre subject presupposing, so, sorry, and if uh, then in that case they are conceptually independent of any um, phenomenal concept because those concepts are a subject presupposing. And then we get premise one. So this is my brief reply. <laughs> Is my hand out going around? No way, my hand out. Anyway, it's up there. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do here is summarize my latest installment in my ongoing dispute with Martina about agent of self awareness and the nature of the conscious self. Uh, I actually have some. References at the bottom of the handout. Um, I have a, a reference to the a, a dialogue that I mentioned earlier, in which basically I'm playing defense against her. She keeps coming at me, and I keep replying, and in the course of doing so, I'm constantly revising <laughs> and trying to improve my position, so I'm taking on board some of what she's saying. In this more recent uh, paper of mine, I'm playing offense. So I'm focusing on a paper of hers published in 2018 called Freedom and the Phenomenology of Agency. And I'm taking issue with some of her claims about agentive phenomenology. I'm setting forth alternative claims of my own. And I'm arguing the greater uh, plausibility of my own claims over hers. So PH1 and PH2 are claims of hers from her 2018 paper. The first one says, in experiencing ourselves as active in behavior B, we experience the behavior as brought about by ourselves in a way which excludes that the behavior is causally determined by previous events, such as occurrent desires or wishes, or by brain processes realizing them. Uh, the second one, PH2, is a parallel claim about experiencing the behavior of others as active. Uh, by and large, I'm going to focus on the first kind of claim. I'll focus on first-person agentive phenomenology. Now, item two on the handout is, oh, oh, I'm, OK, I'm, I'm just doing it here, from here, are some key claims of my own in my forthcoming reply. ECD is short for experienced causal determination. The only kind of experience as of a phenomenon being prior event causally determined that humans are capable of undergoing is an experience as of the phenomenon being passively prior event causally determined. Second claim, NCD, which according to the handout is non-passive uh, casual determination, but should be non-passive uh, causal determination. Any behavior B that is veridically experienced as active is non-passively event causally determined. It is event causally determined, but in a way that involves the exercise of agency. Third claim, EH, which is short for experiential hiddenness, says that any behavior B that is veridically experienced by a human as active is prior event causally determined in a manner that humans cannot experience as prior event causal determination, namely non-passive prior event causal determination. So the inability to experience it in a certain way that it is, that's the experiential hiddenness aspect of it. Now the first thing I do in this paper after setting out my own position is to take up the question of whether her claims, PH1 and PH2, and let's focus on PH1 primarily, are actually experientially manifest, phenomenally manifest. Can we tell for sure just by introspective attention to our agentive phenomenology that PH1 is true? 
Initially, you might think so, because I certainly think that pH 1 has a lot of prima facie plausibility to it. But the thing I want to argue first, in terms of taking, making the case for my alternative position, is that pH 1 is not phenomenally manifest. This leaves open the question whether it's true or false, but the claim is it's not phenomenally manifest. You can't tell for sure just by introspection that pH 1 is true. And the argument goes like this. It's self-evident that pH 1 logically entails not EH 1. If that's self-evident, then if pH 1 is self-evident, then not, pH, not EH is self-evident. So if pH 1 is self-evident, then not EH 1 is self-evident. I put a 1 in there. It should just be not EH, sorry. So fourth line, it's not the case that not EH is self-evident, right? EH is not self-evidently false. And then the rest of the argument connects phenomenal manifestness to self-evidence. You know, if something is phenomenally manifest, then it's self-evident that it's true. So the ultimate conclusion is that uh, Martinez pH 1 is not phenomenally manifest. You can't tell for sure just by introspection that pH 1 obtains. Now, what does that mean? For me, it means that pH 1 is not a directly introspectable truth. It is rather an abductive hypothesis about our phenomenology. Now, I think that what we can introspect for sure, what is phenomenally manifest, it is a kind of datum that is very important feeding into abduction about the nature of phenomenology. And I certainly do think that there are some genuinely phenomenally manifest claims that can be made introspectively by attending to our phenomenology. So the next item for me is to set forth some claims that I think actually are phenomenally manifest. Um, and let's focus on the pH 1 ones, because those are the first person ones. pH 1 star says, in experiencing ourselves as active in behavior B, we experience the behavior as brought about by ourselves in a way which excludes that the behavior is passively causally determined by, prior previ by previous events. Martina has persuaded me of the importance of acknowledging that there's a certain kind of negative content that is phenomenally manifest, a negative aspect of the content of phenomenology. Your phenomenology of agency does, among other things, represent your behavior as not passively causally determined by previous events. That's phenomenally manifest. BH1 crosshatch there's another claim that I think is phenomenally manifest. And experience ourselves as active in behavior B. We experience the behavior as brought about by ourselves in a way which excludes that the behavior is causally determined in the manner experienceable by oneself as prior event causal determination by prior events. That's another negative content aspect of agentive phenomenology that I think is indeed phenomenally manifest. So I'm allowing certain kinds of negative content aspects of agentive phenomenology concerning causation as being phenomenally manifest. But they have to do with passively, with passively experienced causal of determination. And the claim I'm wanting to make is that human agency is non-passive causal determination and I'm wanting to say that that's not experience, experienceable by us as a form of causal determination. That's the experiential hiddenness aspect of it. All right, so these are two competing positions. I'm not sure, but I think uh, Martina wants to claim that pH 1 itself is actually phenomenally manifest. So one thing I've done is to give an argument against that. Whatever, whatever you think is the plausibility of my claim EH, my claim EH, um, I don't think that it's self-evidently false. So even if it is false, I don't think that it has, that its falsity is mani phenomenally manifest. All right, so now what, what's to be said about my position versus hers? 
Um, I'm claiming that the issue is an abductive one. What is phenomenally manifest constitutes data for abduction. But now we raise the question, which of these two positions is abductively more plausible? I actually think that almost all interesting arguments in philosophy take the form of abductive reasoning. Um, in that respect, I think it's similar to most interesting arguments in science. Anyway, what I want to do is, to, and what I say in the paper, is that we can think about the comparative abductive strength of my position and hers uh, in three respective ways that are all abductive, but they're progressively broader than one another. So the first perspective is what I call narrow phenomenology-focused abduction. Basically, we just take uh, introspectively manifest data as our relevant data set, and we ask which of the two positions is more plausible. Well, pH 1 and also pH 2, pH 2 from Martina's own view, I think do seem introspectively quite plausible. And I think my own position that involves this stuff about um, experiential hiddenness probably looks somewhat baroque and maybe somewhat ad hoc from this narrow phenomenology focused abductive perspective. I actually grant that point. If we just focus on the data of manifest introspection, I think she's ahead. Okay. But we need to broaden our abductive perspective. So the second perspective is what I call risk sensitive abduction. If pH 1 and pH 2 are true, but I'm focusing mainly on pH 1, then people's ordinary epistemic standards with respect to the veridicality or non-veridicality of agentive phenomenology are far too lax because I think it's surely at least a live epistemic possibility that all your behaviors are state causally determined. They're state cause to the extent that they're, de that they're determined at all. It's a live epistemic possibility that they are neurophysically state causally determined and that uh, insofar as we have operative supervenient causation that they are mentally state causally determined. It's at least a live epistemic possibility. But if pH 1 is true, then that possibility is excluded. Now, if pH 1 is true, then people are being far too epistemically lax in casually and un unworryingly taking their own ag agentive phenomenology at face value and regarding themselves as agents of the kind that they experience themselves to be. And having a position that entails that ordinary folks in their ordinary practice, including philosophers, um, routinely um, make judgments about veridicality of certain kinds of experience that are epistemically very dubious, that's an abductive cost. It's an abductive cost. On the other hand, if my position is correct, then these ordinary epistemic standards that we actually employ in unworryingly regarding our, ourselves as being agents of the kind we experience ourselves to be are appropriate epistemic standards because there isn't actually any tension between regarding yourself as being an agent of the kind you experience yourself to be and the claim that your behaviors are all um, state caused by prior, prior events physical events and perhaps mental events as well. Now I think there's a yet wider abductive perspective that incorporates the data we've now been talking about but also takes into account matters of well-established scientific knowledge. This I call scientifically informed induction. If, P if Martin's position P pH 1 is true and also pH 2, then as far as I can tell, uh, I, as far as I can tell, her position commits her to saying that if it's true, if pH1 is true, then there must occur physical processes in the central nervous system that are in principle unexplainable, physico-chemically. But available scientific evidence makes it very unlikely that this is so, I would say. Whereas if my position is correct, then the claim that agentive phenomenology is veridical is fully compatible with the scientifically very plausible claim 
that physical processes in the central nervous system are always, in principle at least, explainable physical chemically. So I think by the time we've broadened our abductive perspective enough to incorporate risk-sensitive abduction and scientifically informed abduction, my position is coming out better. Even if my position looks somewhat ab hoc and somewhat baroque from a purely phenomenology-centered abductive perspective. How am I doing on time? Yeah, you have time. You should OK, well then, what I wanted to do briefly here was to point to a striking passage from C.D. Broad, an important book from 1925, The Mind and Its Place in Nature. Uh, Broad was an emergentist, and um, as I'm understanding Martina, she's an emergentist in a way that is in many ways similar to Broad. So he was, I mean, they, they knew then about neurons. Um, there's a, um, did I do something to the microphone? They knew then about neurons. Can you still hear me? <laughs> I can always try to use this. Uh, I'm not sure. They knew. They knew. Something blue. The ghost of C.D. Broad is looking down on us. <laughs> can, can I try to just be loud here? Yes. Let's, let's go through at least some of this passage. He, he, knew, he knew about the, the basic electrochemistry of neurons, and he knew that the brain is a system of neurons. Okay, they knew that back in 1925. And he said, on reflection, the facts suggest that what the mind does in voluntary action, if it does anything, is to lower the resistance. There we are, thank you. Is to lower the resistance. That is the electrical resistance, not the agentive resistance, the electrical re uh, resistance of certain synapses and to raise that of others. The result is that the nervous system follows such a course as to produce the particular movement which the mind judges to be appropriate at the time. Bodily behavior qua movement is caused by things happening in the nervous system, right? On such a view, the difference between reflex, habitual, and deliberate actions for the present purposes, purpose becomes fairly plain. In pure reflexes, the mind cannot voluntarily affect the resistance of the synapses concerned, and so the action takes place in spite of it, in spite of the mind. In habitual action, it, that is the mind, deliberately refrains from interfering with the resistance of the synapses, and so the action goes on like a complicated reflex. But it, the mind, can affect these resistances if it wishes, though often only with difficulty, and it is ready to do so if it judges this to be expedient. I'll leave out the very last sentence. So there's the picture, the mind uh, operating agentively outside of the state causal nexus is directly intervening at key, at key points on brain activity by altering electrical resistances in synapses in such a way that the electrical activity in the brain will now generate the behavior that the mind has in mind. Now, I, I put it to you that from the point of view of informed scientific knowledge, that hypothesis is really quite fantastic and implausible. It's worth thinking, it's worth bearing in mind that it wasn't as fantastic and implausible in, nine, in 1925 as it is now. I mean, one reason why Broad was maybe the last really influential emergentist in the tradition of British emergentism was that back then, as Broad himself correctly pointed out, physics couldn't even explain fundamental chemical facts like the fact that oxygen and hydrogen bond with each other certainly couldn't explain fundamental biological facts about how organisms manage to reproduce. And so 
as a scientific position, emergentism was a lot more plausible in 1925 than it is now. It is, I think, interesting and not even, not a little ironic that in 1925 quantum mechanics was being developed and it took quantum mechanics to explain chemical bonding and it took the, the quantum mechanical explanation of chemical bonding to explain how DNA uh, underwrites um, biological reproduction. And meanwhile, we know a whole lot more about the details of how neurons operate. And what I would say is that uh, the scientific plausibility now of the claim that everything that happens in the central nervous system is in principle explainable physical chemically is vastly even more plausible than it was then. And so this idea that Broad had about how the mind works if it does anything at all is vastly less scientifically plausible than it was then. Uh, at the end I have some references and I also cite um, Broad's 1934 lecture, well known, well known to philosophers, Determinism, Indeterminism, and Libertarianism. So that's uh, nine years after the mind in its place in nature. I, I think in that, in that piece you find him really brooding about whether it's even intelligible, let alone correct, to envision the mind operating in the kind of way he was thinking it might operate in 19. 25. There's really a conceptual problem here, not just a scientific problem. And it, the conceptual problem is not so different from, Cart from Descartes' own problem about how a non-physical substance could causally interact with matter. Can we even coherently conceive of the mind, whether or not it's non-physical, um, intervening on neural activity in the sort of way that he described in 1925. And so I think that Martin as well faces something of a conceptual challenge here to even make good sense of the idea of the human agent exerting influence on the body, presumably via exerting influence on the brain in a way that is outside of the state causal nexus. But even if it's intelligible, uh, I think it's extremely scientifically implausible. And if I understand Martina correctly, she is committed to the claim that things happen in the brain when, when agents are active that are in principle not explainable in physical chemical terms. So thank you very much, uh, Terry, for this, these challenges. Um, now I have to totally change my plan because the, the argument I wanted to comment on is not in your comment anymore. <laughs> so I don't know if the reply that I sent to you convinced you so that you skipped it. Is that possible? That would be great. <laughs> but in any case, it's not there anymore. Doesn't matter. Perhaps this brings us to a more important uh, point. You're totally right, I'm committed to the claim that um, what happens in the brain is not microphysically determined, okay? Um, and of course, most people think that this is incompatible with scientific evidence. But I doubt that it is, and you know a little bit in, in what direction I'm, I'm going here. Um, let me start with what I take to be the most convincing and intuitive way to get to the result that certainly the brain is microphysically determined. And I call this the argument from composition. Right? So we know that new neurophysiologists have studied single neurons in detail in the laboratory. They seem to know exactly how they work and under what conditions they produce how do you call this in English, uh, actions potential, action potential? Okay. What external influences um, make it the case that a neuron produces an action potential? And then the argument um, goes on like this. The brain is simply composed of such um, 
single neurons, right? And everything that goes on in the brain, um, what accompanies our experiences, our decisions, our preparation of behavior, and so on and so forth, is nothing but a certain spatial temporal pattern of um, action potentials in single neurons. So if the single ones are all um, microphysically determined, then those patterns that occur in the brain must be microphysically determined as well. So I take this to be a very strong argument and an argument that I take very seriously. But here's how I try to respond. Um, when you study some phenomenon in a certain context and you generalize to another context, then you must be certain or at least have sufficient reason to assume that there are no relevant, relevant factors that are present in the new context to which you generalize. Right? So for instance, if you observed that water boils at a certain temperature, always at the same level um, in a village near the sea, and then you generalize to water boiling in the mountains, then you make mistakes because there's a factor, the pressure of air that you haven't been taken into account. And now, my point is this. If we take seriously um, the fact that experiencing subjects occur under certain conditions in a matter that is, is arranged in a certain manner, and we realize, and this is now, of course, an emergentist thought, that something totally new comes into existence when an experiencing subject occurs as the consequence of things happening in the brain and an individual that can have experiential properties, and an individual for whom there's something it's like to live its life, to have certain properties that I call experiential. Now, there seems to be something totally new coming into existence on the basis of what happens in the brain. Now, this should also already make us doubtful about whether we haven't a totally new context compared to the context of a neuron in the laboratory. So what we seem to be doing, I would say, is that we generalize from what we know about the behavior of neurons outside brains that are the basis of consciousness to the context where they are integrated, integrated in a functioning brain, which is, as I call it, subject supporting. So we should be very cautious. Is that a generalization, generalization that is justified. In addition, there's another argument, and this argument now is based on anti-epiphenomenalism. There are many dualists today that are, strangely enough, I find, epiphenomenalists. So in my terminology, they say experiential properties don't play any causal role in, uh, in the genesis of the behavior of the conscious subject. I find that really crazy. <laughs> Well, it's, it's obvious, I would say, that when a certain animal um, reacts to being um, struck or whatever, to, to pain, right? It's in virtue of being in pain that the animal is motivated to act in a particular way. And it's certainly part of the nature of what it is to be in pain to play that motivational role, right? So now, we certainly should assume that these experiential properties occur at the high level of, well, the subject, of course, and, are, and supervene on properties at a very high level um, of of the brain. Now, if we accept non-epiphenomenalism with respect to experiential properties, then we come to the conclusion that the brain as a whole gives a rise to causally relevant factors, causally relevant for the behavior of the animal. Right? And if this is so, then it cannot be that it's only microphysically determined. If it's via the activity of the subject due to having certain experiences that the animal acts in a particular way, 
then we have to introduce the subject and its experiential properties in order to adequately explain the genesis of the behavior of the animal. And if this is true, we cannot give um, a purely microphysical account, unless we become perhaps panpsychists and do something very strange about it. Right? So this is the way it, I would like to respond. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, it's now time to open up the general discussion. Uh, there's microphones for the two of you, Martin and, Martin and I um, are wired up, so to speak. And there's also going to be microphones going around to anyone who would like to ask a question. Um, I'm going to be so rude and take the privilege <laughs> and ask the first question. <coughs> because there are parts of the book um, that I'm personally very interested in that haven't come up in the discussion. So far, uh, namely, uh, chapters on self-awareness, self-reference. Um, there's also a really interesting chapter on identity. But I just want to ask a, a very brief question about self-awareness. So if I understood you correctly, you're claiming that um, as experiencing subjects, we're not just aware of the world. We're not just experiencing um, the world around us. We're also always self-aware. Um, and not by logical necessity or metaphysical necessity, but as a matter of fact, we are self-aware, albeit in a way that's pre-reflective, non-conceptual, um, and so something that is also available to non-conceptual beings, infants, animals, um, and so on. And you claim that we need, well, first of all, it's phenomenologically apparent that we are self-aware in this way, but we also need to assume this in order to be able to explain self-reference and also epistemic phenomena such as immunity to error through misidentification with respect to the first person. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, how we are to think of this kind of self-awareness because the characterization, and was, I'm asking this partly because I'm struggling with that myself, so the characterization you give, and, and I say something similar in some of my works is, um, you know, it's non-conceptual, it's not reflective, um, it's, uh, the self doesn't show up as an object of experience, uh, it's a subject of experience, right? So um, would you agree with something like, for instance, the mode content distinction that someone like Recanati introduces where he says, you know, the subject is not part of the representational content, it's, it's more part of the mode. Do you find something like that also in some phenomenolo phenomenological writings like Zahavi? Or how would you sort of positively characterize this? Okay. Oh. So your last, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, you just have to. You just have to shift. So the green light shows up. Oh, sorry. Just like so. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, so your last way to, to put the question puts me in a difficult uh, situation because I find it I find it almost impossible to give a to give a positive account. I, I don't don't even I'm not sure one can give a positive account of it. What one has to do is to find ways to attract people's attention to that phenomenological aspect. And I think that's best what one can do, right? so that other people in the discussion can discover in their own experience that aspect that I call phenomenologically manifest self-awareness. Right? So one can give descriptions, trying to met metaphors. I'm sorry, but what I thought I had a microphone. Yeah, you might, yeah. <laughs> It should. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. sorry. I'll just yeah. give you this just to be doubly sure. So what I was trying to bring across is that I believe the best one can do if one wants to give, tr transmit the idea that we are um, always self-aware in our experience is to attract people's attention to that aspect. That's best. the best one can do. One cannot give a reductive account or a theoretical account, that won't help to discover it. Right? The crucial point is to discover it and then to have a situation of shared reference where people 
think of the same phenomenon in their own phenomenology when they continue talking about it. Right? And that's what I'm trying to do also with negative characterizations, saying something like it's not an object of experience. It's not something that shows up in the stream of consciousness. When you are self-aware in that particular way, it's not that something shows up in all that is given to you and you recognize it as yourself. That's not what's going on. Um, but more concretely now to the um, part about mode and content. I'm not convinced that this works. And this is precisely because I would like to distinguish between self-awareness being, being non-objectual in a phenomenological sense, but objectual in a semantic sense. So when you are aware of yourself as being the subject of a perceptual experience that you are undergoing, then I would like to say that in a sense you are aware of the fact that something, perhaps a tree, is given to you, that you are in the position of the one to whom it's given, right? And if I put it in this way, then it has a propositional content. And the pro propositional content concerns you, yourself, the one who is self-aware. And the very decadity conditions of that self-awareness um, are such that the, the, the subject itself occurs in those radicality conditions. So I don't want it to be put in the mold. I want it to be in the content. And it's only a phenomenological point um, that I'm trying to make when I say we are not an object of our awareness. <laughs> right? Okay. But we are an object in the sense of representational content. Okay, thank you very much. I, we could continue this, but I'm sure there's many other questions out there. Um, so, yeah, could the... Mike, first go to Albert Neven, who's just in the back there. Okay, and then just raise your hands if you would like to ask a question. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Martina. Very differentiated uh, proposal that you're making. So, because of your analytic sharpness, the only way to discuss is to go to the very starting premise. And that's what I want to challenge. Uh, so, the phenomenal, oh gosh, the phenomenal essentialism, it's too loud, sorry. Yeah, it's peeps, it's peeping. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the phenomenal essentialism comes with two claims where I think you already invest dualism. Um, so, look at the ontological claim, um, you presuppose dualism, I think. Pure experiential properties are exhausted by the way it is like to have them. If I'm not a dualist, and um, I say, oh, uh, this is not exhausting ontologically because being antecedent physicalist, there is more to um, exhausting the properties than the pure experiential access to it. Maybe the second claim makes that even then uh, you start with the ontological claim, which I think an antecedent physicalist would not buy. The epistemic claim, and then I try to round it up. Um, so the short version is to say um, that these maximally specific poor phenomenal concepts are nature revealing. Again, if you're a dualist, fine. If you're an antecedent physicalist, you would say, no, there's much more to learn and it is open for being an identity theorist, and so I think the dualism is right there at the start, and if I don't go you, uh, with you at the very start, then mm -hmm. um, how do we uh, kind of come to, to some settlement? <laughs> okay, I think that you're right for certain kinds of, of physicalism, but not for all kinds of physicalism, and so, for the first thesis that you cited and said it already assumes dualism, um, you said that the physicalist cannot accept that there is nothing more to have an experiential property than the way it's like to have it. Mm. But many physicalists would say the way it's like to have it is a condition that a subject fulfills which is identical to fulfilling a certain physical condition. Mm -hmm. And for instance, people who introduced the use the phenomenal concept strategy, 
mm -hmm. they will say something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that Kati Balog, for instance, they, they would say, yes, of course, no problem. But then it's nonetheless identical with a certain physical aspect. Exactly. And uh, sorry, <laughs> let, let me um, respond to the second part of what you said. Um, something similar applies to, to the second, but there it's, it's harder for, for a physicalist to accept, and I admit that. Um, a physicalist can still say, and this is these this um, famous dual carving idea, <laughs> that you can grasp, fully grasp, what it is to have a property via a phenomenal concept, and also fully grasp it via a physical concept, and yet not realize that you are grasping the same property. That's something that I don't accept, and this was in, in one of the premises in the argument that we have seen. But some physicalists would go that way. They say, why shouldn't we have two cognitively, two cognitively independent concepts that are both nature revealing in the sense that I have in mind, both give us access to what it is to have the property, and yet, um, okay. yeah, okay. Thank you, I see the strategy. Right, so there's a question right there. If you could, do we have a second microphone? Or? No, and you'll just have, have, just wait a second for the mic to come. Um, just there. Yeah. I just wanted uh, to know, uh, Martine, do you think that these uh, phenomenal experiences are conceptual uh, in all cases, or would you say they are not? Or no, 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 no. no. They are not conceptual, and no. Um, what does it does it make a difference if then the experience and subject? qualifies them um, as being concepts. But you think they're not experienced if they, they just have it? Uh, so I'm, I'm not quite sure I really understand what you are asking, but you let me try to answer, and then you see if, if it's what you wanted. Um, I have a very broad concept of experience. <laughs> so, um, for instance, very simple animals have experiences. And perhaps they don't have concepts, probably they don't have concepts. And you can have an experience of a certain kind without ever ex having any concept of your experience, for instance, right? So what, what I'm claiming, I'm, I'm claiming a very intimate relation between certain concepts and the nature of experiences. But that intimate relation is the following, it's that experiential, pro pure experiential properties, those properties that just consist in the way it's like to have them can be understood, their nature, what it is to have them, can be fully understood by certain concepts that one can, in principle, acquire if one is the right kind of um, thinking subject, that one can, in principle, acquire in a first personal manner, right? So what's going on is that you focus on a certain aspect of your own experience, exp of your own phenomenology, of the present state in which you are. And then eventually you can form a concept of being in a state with that aspect and you can apply it to others, right? Then you have a real concept of what it is to have that experiential property, which is based on your own access um, by having that experiential property. That, that's the idea. But of course there are many animals that never have any such, such thoughts and we ourselves normally don't have such thoughts. This is exceptional that we have them. It's, Conceptualization it's, is different than from the initial having this experience. We, what we conceptualize is what it is to have the experience, the experience to say it in this manner, right? Yeah. Right, there was a, a question here, so if you could just over the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, on phenomenal uh, concepts and their relation to colors. Um, so some people uh, include concepts of colors among phenomenal concepts, um, but it seems to me that the epistemic accuracy here cannot be that of uh, full access. There are uh, several counterexamples uh, um, uh, about the fact that when we have a concept of color, we have access uh, to, the, to the nature of, uh, of the colors. In the literature, the standard cases are uh, like mixed or pure colors, so 
Apparently, people who count as, as those who have master concepts of colors, such as like scholars in the 19th century discussing about colors, were debating constantly about whether green is mixed or, or pure. So it seems that here we, uh, we, we lack, uh, when we have a concept of color, this, this like epistemic force, so to say. So my question was, do you include uh, concepts of colors among phenomenal concepts, and it seems to me from the Laudatio that's, that you do so, and if you do so, what do you uh, abandon from that uh, epistemic okay. accuracy? Thank you, for, thank you very much for this question. Um, this is an objection that I have to address, and I have actually addressed <laughs> in, in, in the book, and I take the example of Brentano, yeah? that Brentano really thought that green is a, a mixed color, a mixed, it's yellowish and, and bluish, and so when I think that's um, what you're saying, then Brentano seems to have been wrong about the nature of what it is to see green, and so this looks like a counterexample. It looks like he didn't have any um, nature-revealing concept, although he had a phenomenal concept of what it is to see something green. So my response to this is um, to distinguish two things. Um, when I say that... Um, phenomenal concepts of color experiences are nature revealing. I'm only claiming that you can develop, and I'm sure Brentano was capable to do that, you can develop um, a full understanding of the aspect, the aspect that it is, which is, uh, makes it the case that you are now having a green experience as opposed to having a blue or a yellow or a red experience. Um, certainly, Brentano had such a concept. He had in mind the aspect that makes it the case that someone has this kind of experience rather than another. What he did not have is um, a clear understanding of the necessary and even metaphysically necessary connections between um, having a green experience and having other color experiences. Right? So a nature-revealing concept of a particular experience does not necessarily provide that kind of knowledge about the experience. That's my response. Right, I see. So may I brief, briefly, so uh, it's complete access which is abandoned rather than error-free access, right? If I take the two categories ah, of... interesting. Of yes. I, I, yeah. Yes. Okay. Or should I say error-free access? Yeah, I don't know. I'm That's a either. bit strange. But uh, certainly nature revealing concepts do not exclude that you are wrong about... Um, the properties of which <laughs> the way they are integrated in, in, into phenomenal structure, causal structure, and so on. Right. right there's a question right there. I have a simple layman's question about states um, on conditions where people, uh, their agency and their uh, emotions even don't come along with consciousness. I'm thinking of conditions like blindside, where people are able to catch a ball which they can't see, and alexithymia, where people have emotions somehow but are not able to experience them properly as other people. How do you explain it with your theory? Um. I'm not sure what I have to explain. <laughs> can, you, can you make this more explicit? Well, uh, okay. I, I mean, the, the, the psychological fact that there are such cases is something that is beyond my explanatory um, capacities, right? <laughs> that's that's okay. not what I want would to explain. Be, it would be a, a problem possibly with people who are strong physicalists, maybe, which mm. are not also. Perhaps let, let me take the example of emotions to which you do not have. How, how did you, did you Alexa, say it? Yeah. yeah, and how did you describe it? Can you say this again? So you have an emotion, um, but you're not, uh, you're not aware of it. Okay. okay. So now, now we would have to really go into the details what exactly we are saying here. Do you have an emotion such that it's like something for you to have it? Yeah, I think... Okay. Yeah, then, in, in a certain sense, you are aware of it, on my view. It's phenomenally manifest. In that sense, you are aware of it. Well, it's more like... But you are not cognitively aware of it. You do not categorize it, perhaps, in the right manner. That might be the case. Either, the, uh, either it's between the, uh, between the cognitive mm -hmm. um, 
readability, or it is simply that we have to just learn it, and it's just uh, yeah. positionally um, yeah. awareness. I'm, uh, okay, so um, I sometimes experience such kinds of situations. Yes. Uh, okay, so um, I know it a little bit, but I can't. Uh, I don't know what is behind it. Yeah. It could be both, actually. Yeah. And anyway, I think that that. But Such I think cases. it's rather and, and between, the, between the real feeling and being unsure what you have uh, instead of un, uh, unable to express it because you right. can be verbally right. very consequent. It can be, can be actually like, uh, yeah. like a person, like the typical neuroscientist of your, yeah. of your um, Steckmüller Prize who knows <laughs> everything about colors. Uh, and, yeah, uh, and these are interesting cases, but I don't think they put pressure on the account of experiential properties that I propose. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, um, there's a question there, Johannes. <coughs> no, 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 too far. There. Um, so let me go to Terry's uh, 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 suggestion to lo locate you in the broader history of uh, the mind body discussion since the 1960s. So Terry was then bringing up CD Broad, and uh, he seems uh, to have put you in the right category because from uh, what I can guess from your response, uh, your position seems to be quite close uh, on this point with CD Broad. Now, uh, when I was working on these things, the hot position was non-reductive physicalism. Uh, and my question is what happened with this attractive way out of the dilemma? Uh, granting you that the phenomenal properties are partly non-physical, uh, non-reducible to their uh, physical properties, uh, but still granting them uh, 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 causal efficiency, so not going for epiphenomenalism. Why did this uh, position that people were developing uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, why that was that somehow uh, uh, lost in this debate now? Uh, mm -hmm. So what, uh, do you have any good reason for getting desperate about non-reductive physicalism uh, and going back to CD Broad? Um, so, I don't know why other people uh, do not <laughs> look at non-reductive physicalism anymore. I can only tell you why it's not an, an interesting um, option for me. And this is related to something that perhaps wasn't clear enough in what we said so far about the view I'm proposing. Um, I'm not just a property dualist. I put the subject of experience in the center of my research. And I think that um, it's the, the ontological status of the subject of experience that poses the real problem. And what is an experiencing subject? An experiencing subject is an individual that can occur in this Nigelian locution. So, so I give a lot of weight to this Nigelian locution. It's like something for someone to have a certain property. So an experiencing subject is some, someone who can occur there. It's like something for X. An experiencing something is the kind of thing that can occur as X. And I don't see any physicalist account of the experiencing subject. And I don't think that non-reductive physicalism, which was about properties right, and their um, causal powers and so on, has any resources um, for giving us an adequate account of the ontological nature of experiencing subjects. Uh, that's why I mentioned that I want to have non-physical properties with causal powers. So once you allow, you grant me, you grant a non-reductive physicalist uh, this step, yeah. then you would have to have a very strong argument why in addition to that you want to have a, uh, a conscious yeah. subject that's more than a, uh, okay. a, an entity instantiating non-physical properties. Right. Perhaps I, can I briefly? Okay. Um, so I wasn't perhaps clear enough in my response to Terry about what I have in mind when I say that I don't like epiphenomenalism. I'm not just one of those who say that certain properties, other people call them phenomenal properties, have causal powers. It's not to the properties as such that I would um, attribute causal powers. 
it's all via the experiencing subject. And I, what I said before when I, when I talked to Terry in my response is that um, being in pain is causally relevant for the behavior of the subject, not because the being in pain causes the behavior. That's not my view. Or who, who causes the behavior. That's not the view I advocate. The view I advocate is that the experiencing animal actively brings about a certain kind of behavior due to being in a certain experiential state. So it's, it's in this indirect manner, it's always via the experiencing subject's activity that um, the instantiation of experiential properties can become relevant for the behavior. It's not the properties themselves. And so that's, I think, one reason why this old um, debate doesn't help here. I don't see any questions from the audience right now, but Pierre wanted to briefly respond. We're also close uh, to the end of this uh, event, but since we started a few minutes late, I just would grant him the opportunity to. Uh, no, I thought to the historical question, I think this touched on Terry's comments too. My, my uh, reading is that uh, uh, causal exclusion arguments in the 90s had a big effect on this debate. So the central premise there was that uh, every physical phenomenon has a complete physical cause. And then uh, people felt that was plausible and that f felt pressure to either the mind needs to be embedded in the physical world for if, if it's going to have causal, uh, if it's going to cause anything, or it needs to be epiphenomenal. Uh, of course, there are some uh, uh, rebels like Martina who thinks it can be taken out of the physical world and still cause things. But that became a less popular uh, position in the 90s, I think. Is there anything maybe, Terry, you would still like to say? No. Okay, then um, I would say, since we've all had a long day, um, that this is actually, you know, putting the subject in the center of one's thinking. I think that's a really nice note to end on and something we can all reflect on as we go to dinner. And so uh, thank you very much um, for, the, for the great discussion. And thank you very much for attending and for asking questions. Thank you. And congratulations again.